So here's the title of our session. Um, and it is a session that's co-sponsored really by Prescott College and the Conscious Food Systems Alliance, which is a working group of the UNDP. Um, my name is Pavel Senkel. I'm the Dean of Academics uh, at Prescott College in Arizona in the United States. Um, and I'll turn it over to my colleagues for their introductions. Hi, um, I'm Kate. I'm an interdisciplinary researcher and a PhD candidate. I'm working at the intersection of social innovation, inner development and new economics. And I came on board just about a year ago to help design and facilitate the collaborative development process and th synthesize the foundations of the learning framework. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, I am Lisa Trochia. And um, I'm the director of the um, graduate program in transformative food systems at Prescott College. And I'm coming to you evening time, my time from uh, the island of Crete in Greece. So looking forward to this session and hopefully some interaction with you on these exciting topics. Brilliant. Um, and since there are a relatively small number of us, um, and we almost outnumber you all, so I'd love to hear from um, other participants, um, you know, where you, who you are and where you're from and your interest, if you wouldn't mind. Um, Grace, do you want to start and then pass it on to somebody? Sure. Yeah. Um, hi, y'all. Nice to be here. My name is Grace, obviously. Um, I live right now in Rhode Island. Um, Rhode Island, Turtle Island, and I work on a regenerative agriculture farm. I do education there, um, and that is in some ways a new field for me or a new like merging of, of experiences that I've had in the past. So very, um, yeah, just excited to, to learn um, more about this topic from y'all's perspective. Happy to be here. Um, and I will invite um, Sound World. You have your camera on, so you seem like a good, a good next person to go. I am. My name is Vishwa, and Vishwa means either the world or the universe. Mm -hmm. My sense of responsibility about seeing the world in better shape uh, is something that I keep on struggling with a lot. I, I always bite too big. My bites are always too big. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, I, I have been working in food as well. And uh, that was the first breakthrough I really had that I could really, we could do this in time. Hmm. Was the initial, can we do this in time? And how do we do this in time? Was my initial pursuit. And through food and my pursuit, when I let go of everything and I started from scratch again, I was able to figure out something that would have leveled up the whole world with minimal effort. Mm. With this much effort, this much change. But I lost it and then I went academic about it. And I lost it even more. Well, thank you. We're glad that you joined us. Um, would you like to pass it on to someone? I was not there. I don't know. I've spoken before. Okay. All right. Um, uh, Julie Cow, perhaps. Hi. Um, so I'm calling from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, my interest in regenerative food systems, I think, comes from let's say within, I just feel like it's an, in, it's an important thing. Um, I'm also a mother of two little boys and I'm a teacher by trade. So my interests lie in young ones 
being raised with um, everything they need, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And I just am seeing a tipping point where we all just need to be um, in a better place. And this just seems like a really interesting topic. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested to learn. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Julie. Um, I'm going to take this and pass it off to Kristen. <laughs> Did Kristen go with that? Yeah. Okay. Kristen might not be actively there. In which case, Julie, are you there? Julie, do you have two screens? Is that you? Julie Cow? No, I don't have two screens. It might be okay. another Julie. Julie with a cat. <laughs> I wish I could be in two places at once. Wow, well, alas. <laughs> okay, well then I think, um, Maura, do you want to say a quick hello? If you're part of this group. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Maura, and um, I am a food uh, systems person food security uh, sovereignty person, and I'm really looking forward to this talk. Okay, excellent. Oh, there's Kristen. Sorry, uh, I had a technical glitch. Um, so my background is in education, and I am also a student of permaculture. I live in the city, but I also keep some urban chickens, and we've got a whole farming project going on in our yard no grass and I'm starting to work in a, on a collectives in Woodby Island that's trying to invite BIPOC folks the land was entrusted it was it's part of an agrarian commons project and so I'm just here to learn thank you so much for holding this space in this conference thank you Kristen all right so one thing that we'd like to um, begin with, one is I want to put a seed in your head and then turn it over to Lisa for a, for a bit of a grounding activity, is you're going to hear a lot of um, sort of words that might be familiar to you, might not be. Um, and just one of those, when we're talking a lot about regenerative learning and frameworks, it's in the title of this session. And so one prompt just to put in the back of your mind or take some notes or, or sketch um, something or what images, words, or feelings come about is what is regenerative for you? Um, what does that actually mean? It's a word that's coming up more and more in conversations about learning and leadership and um, and agriculture, agroecology, and so on. What does that mean for you? Um, and we'll come back to that throughout. But um, at this point, Lisa, can I turn it to you? Sure, thank you. Um, I wanted to do just a very short grounding exercise to begin the session today. Um, I'm sure your day has already been filled with very exciting and stimulating interactions. So hopefully this will just be an opportunity to refocus and connect with your senses in a way that um, supports awareness and appreciation. So um, I hope that after the exercise, you'll feel refreshed and centered and will remain connected to yourself, able to really kind of extend that conscious awareness to everyone in the session and uh, to the conversation we'll be happen having. So. Um, before we begin, please make sure you've muted yourselves. You're welcome to turn off your camera or not. Um, and I wanted to just start with a few postural adjustments and then do some intentional breathing. So um, if you're walking, <laughs> this might not work for you, but um, if you're seated, I invite you to, you know, put your feet squarely on the floor and to straighten your spine so that you are away from the back of your chair and relax and drop your shoulders. And then I'd like for you to take your left hand and place it over your heart. This energy center in the body is about feeling loved and knowing that you are worthy of love, as well as giving you the capacity to send love out into the world. So when compassion and kindness toward yourself and others is balanced, you're better able to accept and receive love equally. And, you know, even in challenging situations. So um, I want you to leave your hand on your heart chakra and feel the energy as it flows through your body at that point. And then I'd like for you to take your right hand and um, place it on your solar plexus. And this is located near the center of your abdomen. So what we wanna do here is connect with the energy of this area because this is where we create our self-confidence authenticity, 
identity and the sense of knowing what's right for us, our personal power. And so when this energy is balanced, we are connected to our own wisdom and personal truth. So with your hands in this position, I'd like for you to inhale through your nose for a four count and then exhale through your mouth for an eight count or as slowly as you can, clearing your mind and feeling what emerges. And I want you to go ahead and do that at your own place. pace. When you are ready, go ahead and open your eyes and place your hands in your lap. Pick up or touch an item near you. And once you've done that, go ahead and close your eyes again. So I want you to, with your eyes closed, take your time and feel the surface of this item with one or both of your hands. And, you know, kind of try to determine, is this a simple shape or is it more complex? You know, does it feel soft or is it hard or is it a combination of the two? Does it have texture? How does it feel in your hands? Is it heavy? Is it light? Does it make a sound when you move it? I'd like for you to open your eyes now and then just look at the object. Take a moment to recall or imagine how this object came to be near you. Does the object have meaning to you? And if so, spend a minute with those thoughts that emerge from remembering that connection. And if it doesn't have any real meaning to you, imagine why you may have been drawn to the object for this exercise. Take a few seconds and do that. Go ahead and place that object back and place your hands in your lap. And then once again, close your eyes. I invite you to see what feelings or thoughts come forward when you think about what it means to be aware of yourself, especially in the context of the people and the objects that surround you. Slowly inhale and exhale three times as you did at the start of this exercise. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Thanks, everyone, for joining me in this exercise. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and thank you, everybody that's joined us. And we're going to move forward and talk a little bit about why we're here this afternoon or this morning or where, whatever time it is where you happen to be. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, we're, what we're going to do over the next probably half hour or so, um, is outline the sort of some of the context for the project that we've been engaged in. And the three of us, um, Lisa, Kate, and I have been working on this project on and off probably for about two, two and a half years, um, you know, dip, um, depending. And you know, we've gotten to the point where we're really excited to share with the world what we've been working on. Um, and I think in order to sort of set the stage for that, we want to talk a little bit about context. Um, this is a Reimagining Education Conference, the fourth edition of it. Um, and I was, had the pleasure of being here for the two previous years as well presenting, and so have been engaged in this idea of what is what can the future of education look like? And what are the, some of the challenges that um, you know we're facing and how this project that we've been working on can help address some of those challenges. 
Um, so really for me, um, I've been working probably strangely for about a quarter century now um, in education leadership and looking at curriculum development and design. And you know, practice-led experiential learning has absolutely been at the core um, of education. I've had the experience of being at Sterling College in Vermont, at Schumacher College in England, and at Prescott College here, as well as many other places that are you know, by nature practice-led, experiential, um, rooted in really authentic, meaningful firsthand experience and engagement with communities that are both human and more than human. And for me, developing those programs and working with faculty and students to do that has always brought us to the land and always to the place and very often directly into the soil. Um, and you know, there is no more intimate experience you can have with a more than human world than by growing, harvesting, and you know, preparing and eating the food that you've grown. Um, and doing that in concert with communities uh, around you. So for me, working in a higher education context, that's always been absolutely central. Um, and as I look around at you know, an international experience in higher education, you know, those of you who are involved with education in any way, um, it's in a state of crisis, as are so many things. Um, you know, ecological climate change issues, uh, you know, uh, armed conflict, social inequities the world over, and I think a lot of that spills over into the educational context as well. So, you know, higher education, both in the US and in the UK and throughout Europe and many other places in the world is at an absolute tipping point where there's an epidemic of um, progressive university and college closures, um, you know, inequities in access to resources, um, you know, inability to access education because of its high price. Um, exploitation of various groups um, in order to subsidize education and so forth. And so looking at that challenge from my perspective as an educator in higher education and looking at um, some of the challenges in food systems, you know, brings us to a place where, you know, where are the leverage points? Um, and, you know, the work that we've been doing over a couple of years with the Conscious Food Systems Alliance, with the UNDP, and now with Prescott College, um, is, you know, where are those leverage points where we can make it help to transform both food systems and the learning around food systems uh, in order to you know, better um, be able to engage the more than human and the human com uh, communities there and look at environmental justice, ecological, ecological justice, um, agricultural food sovereignty, agroecology, um, and social justice in those contexts. And I might have been repetitive there, apologies. But um, you know, I get excited talking about the intersections of all of these things, because I think food really is at the heart um, of you know, making transformative change in education more broadly. And then, Kate? Thank you. Thanks, Pavel. So, yeah, so, um, you know, to address these crises, this polycrisis, really, we need to go upstream and look within and to shift the kind of collective ways of being and thinking and doing that have produced them and to find new ways or remember old ones of relating that are based on care, trust and a real shared awareness of our, our deep in interconnectedness. Um, but to promote that kind of shift in consciousness, we believe that a very different kind of education is needed to the prevailing Western style of mainstream education that, that most of us receive. And that's the kind of education that welcomes the whole person, one that integrates hands-on embodied learning, socio-emotional development, um, and critical discourse with reflexivity so that learners gain not only the practical skills and the real life experience that they need to, to engage in regenerative work on the ground, but also so to develop the inner capacities that the kind of the new ways of relating and thinking and seeing and being that are necessary for leading transformational change. Great, thanks. I'm trying to click all the right things at the right time. So it's a little bit tricky. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is, um, so just how, how we're addressing that. And thanks, Kate, for that context. Um, you know, we have a, I have a couple of models that I want to share here, and please do feel free to take screenshots of all this because there, you know, there might be text on these uh, slides that I'm not going to cover specifically. But, you know, I developed this diagram uh, relatively recently to think about, you know, a different approach to designing learning um, that integrates, you know, what we have listed on the right, distributed agency, um, collaborative co-creative co approaches, 
um, you know, dynamic structures, inclusive design, equitable exchange of knowledge experience, and her development of her new network identities, which, 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 which we can talk about. But effectively, you know, the diagram tries to simplify that and saying, you know, all of these things, you know, we talk about under the umbrella of a regenerative learning model, that if we fully integrate um, and decenter the human necessarily from some of these conversations and reconnect community ecology and practice in an authentic and deep way, uh, that that can yield an approach which manifests itself in a more distributed model. Um, so the sharing and collaborative approach across different nodes, um, and we've got a little bit of a distributed model in the upper right hand corner of each one of these slides, right? That's sort of what a distributed network diagram looks like uh, without a center, um, but you know, with, with the the power and the authority uh, spread across that network, and that also that serves to deinstitutionalize. So take learning out of the formal structures of institutions, um, particularly in the higher education or you know, secondary or post-secondary contexts, um, you know, it's been, you know, quite sort of segmented away from real world meaningful experience, particularly with place and with community. Uh, and then that can yield a more democratic um, and, you know, decolonial approach to some of the learning that we're talking about. And so by integrating community ecology and practice yields to a distributed, deinstitutionalized and democratic model. Um, and this next slide has lots of words on it. Um, and so please feel free to save these. These are really from our conversations and from various work that we've um, it, we've written on uh, some of these processes, really about you know, sort of thinking that reimagining the future and reimagining these processes are not a theoretical exercise. It has to be a lived practice. So how do we again, um, you know, reconceptualize in a regenerative fashion? that putting lived practice, practical experience, place-based relationships, and a nature-centered paradigm at the center of imagining our future of learning, um, rather than you know, what's more traditionally framed, which is quite the opposite. Um, and it often involves grounding ourselves and reshaping our relationships with the land and with one another. And so again, please take a, take a screenshot of this. But one of the prompts that you know, we wanted to ask in, this, in the context of this talk is, you know, if you think about your own work, um, what small practice or habit could you adopt that would embody this sort of mindset in your daily work? Um, and, you know, how might that ripple out into wider systems that you engage with? So really, you know, we're all proponents of backwards design, which is a, um, an educational pedagogical model where you start with the outcomes and you work backwards to the beginning. And so what are those little beginning steps that you might see yourself taking that you'd adopt a more regenerative mindset in your daily work? Um, and then, you know, really explicitly, and I'm constantly having conversations with colleagues about how we embody this, um, what, what might it mean to learn with the land uh, and invite the more than human into the classroom, not as a topic of study, but as a co-facilitator, a co-educator, and a co-creator? And that can be a farm, that can be a garden, it can be a river, um, it can be any, uh, you know, any number of species that you explicitly engage with in the context of your learning. Um, so again, another prompt, you know, what might it mean for you in your context to learn with the land rather than about it, um, in it, with it, and how do you recenter the more than human in these conversations that we're having? So again, a couple of prompts that we might come back to if we have time. And then one additional visualization of this um, model of a regenerative learning model. Now I want to focus, there are lots of there are words around the outside, uh, which are in some ways reference the previous couple of slides, you know, a learning system that, you know, is grounded in ecological design thinking, um, empowerment, adaptability, you know, all of those words, I won't read them all, uh, but I wanna focus on the, the panarchy model, so the adaptive ecological cycle model that's at the center, which is really the core element of the approach that we've been taking where, you know, it's clearly iterative, um, not necessarily circular, but you know, re unfolding and refolding into itself. So no matter where you start, uh, whether it's with cultivation and you emerge into a flourishing and thriving ecosystem um, and community, and then you know, changes happen in ecosystems, change is a natural part of that process of any learning paradigm. You imagine and then you co-create you know, with the human and the more than human then you recultivate and flourish and thrive. So it's an iterative developing and regenerative process that's really at the foundation um, of, of this model and what we've been talking about. Thanks, Savelle. 
Um, so we partnered with the Conscious Food Systems Alliance, um, which, as Pavel mentioned earlier, is a backbone organisation that's convened by the UNDP um, that brings together food, agriculture and consciousness practitioners um, around the common goal of cultivating the inner capacities that activate systemic change and um, regeneration in food systems. Um, and um, the Conscious Food Systems Alliance has a worldwide network of grassroots members. Um, could we move to the next slide, please, Pavel? <laughs> uh, so th this, is <laughs> this is the visual of those members. Uh, so um, yeah, members who, who share this same vision. Um, and after doing a lot of initial scoping and trust building work with these different grassroots members, we decided to partner with 10 of them um, so there are 10 land-based learning centres that are located um, around the world, right from um, Asia to Africa to Latin America, um, to explore how we might collectively develop a learning offering that would be really transformative and also have the potential to scale deep and to seed place-based regeneration in the hearts and minds and, and also the cultures of local learners in different bioregions around the world. Um, so uh, over the past two years, together, we've begun to co-create a learning programme that we believe has the potential to do exactly that by cultivating the inner capacities of these learners to become pioneering leaders in their local food systems. So what do we mean by pioneering leaders? Well, um, we mean leaders that have not only the pra practical and technical skills, um, and also the entrepreneurial competences and lived experience to engage in meaningful and holistic regeneration work on the ground in food production, food distribution, or um, other related activities, but also leaders that can manage complexity, that can lead with purpose, agency, and integrity, and leaders who can listen deeply and engage and inspire their communities and also know how to share power and collaborate with those communities to catalyze change from the bottom up. Um, and then in terms of the inner capacities that we're talking about, well, you know, on the whole, we mean mental models, you know, the values, qualities, competencies that enable um, us to think and act and relate in a way that favors collaboration, stewardship, empathy, inclusivity, openness to diverse ways of knowing. So while in this program that we've created, food um, production and distribution and consumptions, the vehicle of a lot of the learning, the key underlying transformations that we're seeking are in the ways of doing, seeing and relating. Um, and then in terms of, um, uh, I, I kind of have a question for all of you, another prompt, which is to have a think about how inner capacities are relevant in your own work and how um, the building them might support the work that you're doing. Great, thanks. And thanks, Mara, for putting the prompts in the chat. Really appreciate that, that we can come back to those. Um, so really sort of reflecting back on or building on the last couple of slides, um, our approach to this particular project so developing a, um, a global network that's distributed, focusing on regenerative local leadership and food systems, um, our approach has really been, uh, you know, again, globally distributed. So working with uh, working equitably um, and in a, a sort of relational process you know, with partners across the world. Um, and, you know, it's taken two, two and a half years because that takes time. Uh, you know, to cultivate the relationships and to help develop the, the you know, through that process, develop effectively what's become a curriculum um, through consensus-based decision-making, um, holacracy-style governance, and an equitable exchange of knowledge, and then collective reflection and iteration. And so, hearkening back to the Penarchy model a few slides ago, you know, that collective reflection and iteration, had, we've gone through the cultivation, the co-creation, the flourishing, and then sort of the reimagining um, and continuing to cycle through throughout this process. Sorry, I keep forgetting to unmute myself. <laughs> So when it came to designing um, both the co-creation process and the framework for the learning programme, there were a number of considerations that we had to factor in. Um, and the first was that we were going to be working across different geographies, different time zones, in diff 
different languages and, and, and very different cultures as well. And the you know, almost all of these learning centres being grassroots had very limited resources in terms of finances and time. So we needed to make sure that we had a really clear, well-structured um, and streamlined co-creation process um, that had built-in flexibility. And the way that we translated that into the design was to kind of morph into different group formations um, for, for different purposes. So for example, we would meet as a whole group um, for planning and reflecting and making important decisions. But we then split into working groups to kind of cluster our expertise for curricular design and learning outcome co-creation. Um, and then um, individual centers would then work asynchronously um, with a peer reviewer for their individual session planning. Um, the second consideration were the, the kind of the politics of the approach. So again, given the mix of kind of contexts and cultures, there was quite a range of expect expectations of the process um, from the different centers, both in terms of the level of input that each of them would have, um, and also the, the, the expected kind of quality of, of, of outcome and output that, that we were aiming for. So we needed to make sure that right from the outset, we had a really clear ask in terms of the time and the deliverables and a clear roadmap and a set of collaboration principles that we arrived at through consensus. And then the third kind of challenge, um, which was also really quite hard to get our heads around initially was the, the issue of target audiences. So of course, the, the local contexts of each learning center vary hugely, um, as do the needs and expectations, the, the different languages and, and the level of education of the, the local learners in each place. So that meant that it wouldn't really be practical or desirable to create a prescriptive or a homogenous set of learning materials and just expect them to be delivered um, in every single center successfully. So the way that we got around that was that after crafting the high level learning outcomes collectively, we again built in flexibility um, to, for specific content um, of each session to be developed and delivered locally by the different individual learning centers themselves with their own local audiences in mind. And then to ensure the kind of cohesion of the program and the, the collaboration and exchange among the different learning centers within the network, um, we developed this idea of uh, what we called integrated experiences, which is like more uh, widely applicable learning content that's created by either individual learning centers or groups of learning centers. Um, in a format that can be shared with the whole learning network. So it might be in a pre-recorded video or a facilitated workshop or session that enables learners in one part of the network or one part of the world to learn from centers in other parts of the world. And this really kind of fosters a sense of diversity and community among the network and promotes different like other ways of knowing across it. Um, so yeah, just to say that, you know, that as a process was really deeply iterative and a collaborative piece of work. Um, Pavel, can we switch slides, please? <laughs> oh, that one, thanks. <laughs> um, and it really allowed us to harness the expertise and the experience that's available within the network and fostered that kind of equitable exchange of knowledge among the different learning centers and created, created the conditions for synergy and innovation to happen. And one really important part of that intervention was the reverse engineering of the curricular design process that I know that you're planning to speak about next, Lisa. Yeah, sure. Um, acknowledging the sort of this huge amount of work that the partners were putting into developing topics and thematic learning outcomes, um, envisioning scenarios that would be inclusive and experiential, we just wanted to provide some structural support uh, using this sort of reverse design approach. So we suggest some tools and frameworks that could help create measurable goals, uh, lesson plans and objectives, um, uh, you know, sort of as a means of informing the development of content and learning activities in order to maximize a very successful learning experience. So being able to evaluate what works and what can be improved is critical to understanding impact, of course, but 
in this process, I think we all quickly came to appreciate the need to be inclusive of diverse ways of knowing. In other words, you know, sort of being open to the ways that we can evaluate successful instruction and learning by accounting for what might be less quantifiable, spirit-based, cultural, sensory, or affective ways of knowing. So I think this will really be an exciting and ongoing discussion, uh, especially as we move forward and consider ways to connect the work that's being done by the partners uh, with the potential for academic credentialing. So as well, we reviewed techniques to design the facilitation and general organization of the lessons, and these were just bringing forward simple planning steps that help with the ability to stick to a timeline, account for transitions between activities, provide bio breaks, you know, and include the value of making space for community building. So all of the small details that factor into creating an effective and efficient learning environment. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and and yeah, as you were saying, I think what that that kind of diversity and, and the synergy created through that diversity allowed for a really beautiful learning program to emerge. Um, you know, the content feels like it's really inspired by a pluriverse of wisdom that, that weaves together place based and indigenous knowledge from around the world with more contemporary agroecological practices systems thinking and other conscious and regenerative approaches to food production and distribution and consumption, um, as well as weaving in those kind of transformational leadership competencies. And um, next slide, please. <laughs> and and yeah, it, uh, it follows a head, heart and hands pedagogy with a really deeply practical kind of hands on community based projects to ensure that the learners are getting the lived experience that they need to develop into pioneering leaders in their own local communities, whilst also developing those inner capacities and practical skills to be effective in that role. Yeah, so, and just to pick up on that, we've, we've referenced this concept of transformative several times, and I wanna talk a little bit more about that. So, you know, generally speaking, when we seek transformation, we understand it requires action or process, and that it's typically positive, important, and it results in profound or lasting change. But increasingly, as the world understands the extent to which our challenges are entangled, appreciating a complexity paradigm, if you will, transformative change is associated with interconnectedness, with relationships. So as an educator myself, I'm going to suggest that above all else, education is about relationships. So it is in this sense, the educational model uh, that we're presenting to you today is engaging with transformative change. We can also think of regenerative learning, as Pavel discussed, as transformative learning, an intentional pedagogical design that supports the process of experience, reflection, critical discourse, self-awareness, and emergent changes in perspective as being relational um, and in a dynamic where education is the structure that facilitates change in both the learner and the educator, necessarily impacting our worldviews. So these kinds of relationships are what build capacity for society to be transformed. Um, and I think we can switch to the next slide. Um, so in this then, I wanna bring forward another important element of this particular process of transformative learning. And we've talked about this as being an innovative educational model that's collaborative, participatory, involves leadership development and distributed learning. And, and in this case, over multiple continents um, and all of this centering consciousness practice. I just wanna be clear about why the context of this work is regenerative food systems. And Kate shared a slide earlier that talked about uh, the Conscious Food Systems Alliance and their strategies to create a more regenerative food system, but there's more. <laughs> And I, I really didn't know when I started thinking about this, what you know your level of awareness would be about food systems, but quite a few of you are working in this area. So you know that's wonderful um, because you understand 
this a bit as an area of study and concern and why the global community is calling for systemic changes, uh, complexity-based approaches um, that in fact must change the food system. And so, you, you know, I could talk forever on this, but what's important to know is just that food systems are really implicated in some of the most difficult challenges that we now face. But truly, um, in that, the opportunities to design changes in the food system is what can deliver some of the most exciting and impactful ways forward, approaches that can shift multiple systems. So I'll say simply, owning my bias as a food systems and complexity scholar and educator, that I really believe that food is the great connector. Because we all eat, it's through this lens of food systems. And Kate has referred to that. But, you know, what I mean is that interconnected systems of food production, food processing, distribution and marketing, preparation, consumption, and even the systems that attend to food waste. It's through these relationships we can educate we can build inclusive networks with diverse partnerships, design structures and experiences that get folks out of silos and into collaborative spaces where social, political, economic, and environmental interests are all understood for the complex ways they are connected. So strategically transforming food systems can in fact leverage transformative social change. Um, so I want to share with you this last slide, and you, you could move on um, on my bit anyway, um, if you're interested to see how this type of thinking manifests in higher education. I really want to invite you to explore this new online degree program at Prescott College. Um, the Master of Arts in Transformative Food Systems is the first degree of its kind in the world. It's a leading edge response to the planet's urgent challenges. And it is a unique partnership with the Con uh, Conscious Food Systems Alliance. Uh, the curriculum includes Conscious Food Systems perspectives. Uh, it's a 36 credit hour uh, online, asynchronous yet highly experiential program and is designed to be completed in two years as a part-time student or one year full-time. So, um, you know, wrapping it back around to this project we're presenting, we've really learned a lot. We've learned from working with COFSA and our partners on this project to cultivate a global curriculum for local leadership in regenerative food systems um, in that it has informed our pedagogical approach to developing this degree. And we are really, truly very excited to offer a graduate program that honors place-based and diverse ways of knowing and supports collaboration, network building and complexity thinking as the tools we need to empower food systems leaders. So in this program, um, students are, are gonna be engaged with the work of understanding how to guide the emergence of transformative change through food systems change in ways that can establish food justice, create inclusive regional economies, address climate change, advance regenerative and agroecological approaches to the environment, support policy reform, and promote sustainable health and well-being. So it's super exciting stuff, and I did just want to share this all with you, um, So and invite you to please reach out if you would like to know any more. So that's my bit. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to put some of this stuff in the chat because, you know, given that we have, I think, 10 minutes or so left or 12 minutes left in this session, um, we had thought, and, and we have a relatively small number of folks in the group today, um, that we've, we've um, you know, throughout the talk here, we've shared a number of different prompts, um, you know, to help you potentially think uh, actively about how what we're talking about can uh, intersect with your own work and in your own communities, your own organizations and, and your own lives. So some of the questions we've asked are, you know, at the beginning, you know, when you hear the term regenerative, you know, what images, words, or feelings have come to mind? Um, what small practice or habit could you adopt that would embody a regenerative mindset in your daily work? And how might that ripple out wider? Um, and then what might it mean to learn with the land? You'll recall that in conversation earlier. You know, what changes if we actually see gardens and farms as participants in the learning process and foundational to the experience rather than 
um, tangential or marginal or simply places we go? And how is inner capacity um, relevant in your work? How is consciousness, which is a key element of um, you know, of this regenerative learning network that we've created. And how, how's that important to you? And how might building on that um, support the work that you do? And now, you know, I, I might, I think we'll put this in the chat as well um, so that we can, you know, perhaps have this conversation in a Q&A as a larger group in our last minutes here. But really, what outcomes can you imagine thinking about the backward design process we've been talking about um, you know, what outcome can you imagine from a learning process that centers these inner capacities, uh, regenerative practice and transformative learning? And what steps could you see yourself taking right now or in the near future to move in that direction? Um, and then what challenges might you see in your path as an organization? And I think we've grappled with all of these questions in, in our own process, both, um, and, you know, to I think to Lisa's last slide, you know, talking about, um, you know, the work that we're doing here at Prescott College, it's really interesting for me to recognize that all of this work is being in, done in parallel. Uh, and so, you know, whether it's a master's program or whether it's a global distributed network or whether it's this conversation, we're all striving toward a similar outcome, uh, which is how we can find where how we can find the leverage points um, to make change both in the food system and in our educational structures and where those two intersect to make the most meaningful change. Um, so we can put these in the chat and I'm going to stop sharing so I can see everyone. Um, and then come back as a group. So let me see if I copied the right thing. I did. There's a whole bunch of text in the chat, which is from that last slide and also the other prompts that we've had throughout. Um, and I have a question for Maura about if we're going to share the slides afterwards. And if there's a link that we can send out to participants, Maura, after the fact, then I'm happy to do that. So we can, we can find a way to do that for sure. Um, and I know some people joined during the talk, so welcome. I'm glad you're able to join us, and hopefully you found that um, instructive, interesting, or you know it might have raised some questions for you. So I think why don't we hold space now in our last uh, you know nine or ten minutes here, if there are questions or if there are responses to any of those prompts that you'd like to share. Uh, excuse me, uh, Pablo. I just wanted to say we can stay longer. There's no one going to be needing the room immediately if you want to stay an extra ten minutes if you're available. Okay, I think some of some folks may have other appointments, such as me, unfortunately. But um, yeah, we can stretch it a couple of minutes. So I saw a hand up from somewhere. Yeah, go ahead, please. Sound world. So the name is Vishva, and uh, what I feel, what I I intuit, and you might. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but complexity takes no outcomes. It takes a direction. And because you're talking about a course, a pedagogy at play, what you're doing is you're leaving the impact to the students. And that is your way of losing directionality and still bringing in consciousness but bringing in consciousness with the and complexity, they like evolving people and complexity don't really gel together. And you're trying to merge it together. And there are two different types of thinkings and presuppositions that are interplaying. And I want to know if I, I, I am pointing at something raw and how have you seen through it and what advice do you have for that? I'm I'm happy to start, but also we'll defer to my colleagues on that as well. Except, you know, Lisa has at both Lisa and Kate have worked quite deeply in this area. And that's a brilliant question that actually gets at some of my frustrations. Um, I'll be quite honest in being uh, an administrator in a higher education setting. Uh, where there are structures, and I, I talked quite a bit about deinstitutionalizing things, um, which a lot of people in higher education don't really want to hear. Uh, you know how we distribute in a much more sort of um, you know, democratic, egalitarian, equitable way uh, some of the generation of knowledge, uh, so that it isn't transactional, which is the traditional higher education framework. 
um, but actually does create space for, I really appreciate how you talk, you know, described complexity as engaging the learners beyond the confines of the institution. Um, and whether it's inviting them to, you know, uh, you know, participate in in sort of relationship with more than human and human communities. Um, it's we can plant seeds of that in the context of an educational structure, um, but it's always for me, um, and I, I don't have an answer to this. Right, is to find the balance between uh, allowing that flexibility, creating space for relationships to to emerge um, that do from complexity. Uh, to create the the space and the invitation for conscious inner capacity practice, um, whilst at the same time, uh, you know, how, seeing how that fits within the framework of any sort of educational paradigm or institution. So I'd say it is a challenge, um, but I think you know this is one step and one opportunity to 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 move in that direction. I don't know if Kate or Lisa, you had anything to add to that, but. I don't. That was that was brilliantly said. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, same. Yeah, I'm sorry if that doesn't quite answer the question, but just I think what I want to share is that I'm struggling in my context with that same question, and that I don't think I have a solution yet. Um, but I think it's a, it's an absolutely important one to continue to come back to. Yeah, and and honestly, if you want to reach out, um, I'd be willing to have a, a conversation with you about this. I think it's very exciting. Um, there there are lots of tangibles and intangibles involved in all of this. So um, so I invite you to do that as well. We could continue the conversation. I don't know if there are any other comments or questions, or observations or sharings. I, I have one. It's a little bit, um, maybe a little bit outside the realm of, of what you want to be talking about. But um, in my work um, with, directly with farmers, as a farmer myself, uh, um, long time organic regenerative farmer, working with others in a in a changing climate, um, I wonder. Well, I have two questions. One is, what are you seeing a lot of interest in the academy? For these subjects, are you finding, I see you have the new master's program, are you finding that there's a longing for this uh, kind of uh, uh, curriculum? And secondarily, how are you really managing with farmers on the ground who can no longer grow the crops that their ancestors have grown for uh, thousands of years uh, and trying to figure out how to be in the world anymore? Is that coming up in your work and how do you, how does your collective engage with that? Yeah. Lisa, do you want to go with? Well, it's a great question. And I think that, um, yeah, folks are interested. Um, and uh, what we can do is start having these conversations. I think there's, there's no one who knows the answer to all of this straight up, or we would have solved the problem a long time ago, right? So having de designing structures where we can have this, you know, have discourse, have have discussions with each other, and figure out ways, um, considering the complexity of all of this, to um, to work to work towards something. I mean, there are huge challenges, right? Um, so. You know, I, I don't have the answer. You don't have the answer. But the hope is that together, you know, we can we can come up with something that will, um, you know, work toward um, changes that that can transform from where we are to to a better place, to a place where, where we want to be. Um, but you might want to add to that, Pavel. Yeah, I, I can add just a little bit to that, and then uh, Kate, you you might as well. Just that um, I think your question about demand, absolutely. Um, at every institution that I've worked at. Uh, I've come to develop uh, or support the development of sustainable agriculture, regenerative food and farming um, programs, you know, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. Um, and there is absolutely a, a desire, uh, and I think a felt need, both on the part of people in the academy, uh, as well as uh, farmers, food practitioners, um, you know, those involved in any level of the food system, um, that it's broken. Uh, and how can we 
you know, is this a leverage point? And, you know, is this, can we, you know, take whatever resources, you know, ac the academy may have, both in network developments, supporting partnerships, finding grant funding, um, you know, which are all things that we're working on, you know, to be able to support exactly that sort of work. Um, you know, the small scale, uh, you know, agricultural provider, um, you know, in place. And I think one of the reasons that we have developed this, this project with the Conscious Food Systems Alliance and that we've seen, um, you know, you know, Kate has done an initial, you know, survey, you know, over a year ago about, you know, more than a dozen, uh, you know, participants across, you know, six continents have come forward and said, you know, we want to participate on volunteering their time because one, they recognize that they have something to contribute um, as members of the food system and also recognize that they need support. Right. So how many, how can we both through funding mechanisms as well as through, you know, the strength of network development can help support small scale providers who might be isolated in their communities uh, from others um, and don't have the support that they could, could use. So hopefully the work that we're doing is going to benefit those folks. Um, Sarah, I saw your hand go up and down. Do you still have a comment? Kia ora. greetings from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, yeah, I, I don't know so much if it's a question, but um, certainly a comment. Um, I'm very involved in the food growing space here, and we have Indigenous ways of knowing that inform regenerative ways of being. And in working more and more in that space, I'm in my final year of an Indigenous certification in growing food. Um, I'm very aware that Pākehā, so I'm a New Zealand-born European who's been here since the 1800s, and we call ourselves Pākehā. Um, our Pākehā ways of being, which are very oriented towards the dominant paradigm that you see in many other countries, um, do not support um, Māori ways of sorry, our Pākehā ways of doing do not support Māori ways of being. And there's this real um, tension that, you know, we're all sort of reflecting now, and I could hear that you're grappling with it in your work that you do, between, you know, wanting to universalise and, like, spread great practices of returning to ourselves, each other, and the planet, and the deep importance of getting, like, hyper-local, you know, and the... There's a, an honouring place, and for us in Aotearoa, um, we have a leader here called Tina Ngata, and she talks about how a decolonial future is a hyper-localised future. And so there's just this big tension in these conversations, you know, because I feel like in the dominant paradigm, we want a framework, we want to universalise, we want to spread, we want to network, but actually maybe it's the fractal that is from the hyper-small and the hyper community oriented that from there the transformation happens. I don't know. And I'm, you know, I'm one of these people that likes to think in systems for a long time, but more and more I've been orienting more towards like my what's my at shoulder relationship? How can I get at shoulder and behind the aspirations of the indigenous people who I live in relationship with here and now? Um and so there's not really a question there, but it's just it's just right. Yeah, I think you've seen all of us nodding, but absolutely. Um, you know, we, we're, I'm, I'm grappling with those things. I, I don't know if, you know, Kate, you want to speak to this at all because you've been in these conversations as well. I mean, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And, and I think that's the tension that we're all holding and that is, you know, it, it's emergent, but I think one, one idea that I really love personally that I was talking to Pavel and Lisa about just a few hours ago is this idea of a pluriverse you know, where, are the, where there are many, many <laughs> beautiful, like very individual um, hyper-local realities that are, can all exist, collect, you know, at, at one and the same time. Absolutely. And they can all be linked, you know, in a distributed network. So maybe the information's flowing, but in throughout the network and, and we can perhaps like reap, harvest the best practices and, and, and the expertise and experience of of the network but really what we need to be doing yeah. is creating place-based cultures and really rooting ourselves in in the local reality yeah I suppose like where there's such a danger here of like recolonizing spaces 
um, and a new version of colonization in, in this sort of space. I often orientate towards the more than human world and the way an ecosystem works. And every plant in a garden, you know, like the corn is being caught and it's full and total power and it's contributing, it's exudate to the soil. And it's helping all the other plants in the ecosystem flourish. And the peas are doing their thing and the tomatoes are doing their thing. And they all stand in there like what they own as themselves and they contribute to the health of the whole. There's no one plant in that ecosystem that's like, right, this is the framework. Like, there's no one plant in the garden doing that. And I just quite like to think about ourselves as plants. And if I see myself as a tomato plant in the ecosystem, how do I, how do I contribute to the ecosystem? And for me, like it's not telling, it's not creating a framework for the way a garden should look or be or flourish, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a beautiful analogy. Uh, Grace, Grace had a hand raised, I believe. Next yeah, sorry. Then... I don't. I don't know why. I can't figure out the hand raising on Zoom. I've used Zoom for years. I don't know what's going on. My brain's like short circuiting. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to. I was hoping to find the name, but I can't right now. But at the last uh, reimagining education conference, there was a talk by this. Um, it's like a, a network that uses the framework of the pluriverse. I I think they're called like pluri oh, pluriversal alliance. It's something like that. Um, but their model is bridging hyper localities. So it's kind of like what we're talking about of like groups who really prioritize hyper local knowledge, then sharing information and sharing practices. But it's not that there's like a one standardized universal methodology. Um, so I highly recommend finding them if you can. I have not given you a lot of information, but maybe if you look at last year's schedule. Um, but I think I remember that talk and being really um, impressed by seeing the concept of pluriverse in action in a way that really tried to grapple with this tension of local and, and um, yeah, the, the bigger collective. So, yeah, I hope that's helpful and someone finds it. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Thank you, Grace. It's really helpful. So, Mara, I'll be guided by you in terms of the timing here. Uh, I think I think we have another minute. Um, Julie had her hand hand up. I think, Julie, did you want to say something? You're you're muted right now, yeah. and then we'll, then we'll wrap it up uh, with great thanks to our presenters and all of you for coming. Yes, ahead, um, this is a lovely talk, and it's inspired a lot of um, reflection. So I want to thank you all. Um, but I also, you know, in listening to this reflection that we've had the last couple minutes it made me think, okay, well, we know what to do. Can we just like create a structure and make people do things? <laughs> and I realized like, obviously that's not the answer, um, but with some self-reflection, um, there's, there's a need for a relinquishing of control. I think that is really my problem and probably a lot of people who do wanna impose top-down structures, there's a need for a relinquishing of control, right? allowing self-organization and allowing a lot of these grassroots movements to happen. Um, trust that things will happen, good things will happen when relationships are built. So to me, I feel like that is really the starting point for all of the rest of what we're talking about to take place is going out and talking to your neighbors, forming relationships where you actually get to know each other one-on-one. -on -one. It's not just a name and you know this person lives there, but you actually know them. And then when the relationships are there, that these you know other things will fall into place. So I just wanted to add that, that that came to my mind. But thank you. 100%, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Julie. Thanks so much. And really, thanks everyone. This has been a lot of fun. Really appreciate the discussion and, and everybody you know, showing up for this. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much.